if you're watching this video then that means that you like the first video enough to watch this one so thank you for that in this video i want to talk about incidents at gitlab how do we handle incidents what are the causes of the incidents who are the people who are involved in an incident who solves the incident who can trigger an incident and everything about incidents so what is an incident an incident is an event that happens and um, it affects our SLOs negatively enough that we are looking at it or there is an outage in one of the services that are required for GitLab.com to function properly or our deployments are blocked for one or more reasons. So an incident is basically an event that happens and that requires the immediate attention of the engineer on call and perhaps some of the other team members. Let's talk about who is involved in the incidents. First, the engineer on call. We know that for sure this person is responsible for mitigating the cause of the incident it doesn't mean they're responsible for doing that on their own if they think that the incident is bad enough they can involve other people so as we said the reliability team is the team that is participating in this on-call rotation so basically this rotation is covering 24 7 um, so we've got EMEA, APAC, and America's time. So there is always someone who is on call. If the engineer on call decides that the incident is severe enough, they can involve the incident manager on call, which is short IMOC. The IMOC is sort of the second line after the engineer on call. So if the engineer on call is able to resolve the incident by themselves, perfect. But if they can't, then they can call for help. And the IMOC is going to come. The IMOC has their own role. And what the IMOC does is they ensure that all the resources needed to mitigate an incident are present. So what the IMOC does, for example, let's say the incident requires someone from the development team or from the security team. So what they're going to do is they're going to ping them through Slack or maybe page them if they are participating in an on-call rotation as well. For example, the dev team. Um, the IMOC would also involve the communication manager on call, which is the CMOC. And um, the CMOC uh, would be responsible for relaying messages about the incident to the end users. So if the end users are affected and we need to relay messages to them, um, we basically page the CMOC on call, the communication manager on call. And the people who are responsible for doing that at the moment uh, are from the support team. More specifically, the... Um, GitLab.com support team. Uh, so um, these are the main three people who are involved in the incident. But of course, if the incident is severe enough, you always find people from different teams. Let's say, for example, the deployment is blocked because of an incident. You might find someone from the delivery team in the incident room. Uh, let's say, for example, the incident is affecting a part of the infrastructure that um, is rarely modified. And maybe someone who's been in the team for a long time knows more and they happen to be from the delivery team. So we are going to call for help. So we're going to call them on Slack saying, hi, please join the incident room. We're going to talk about what the incident room is. So keep watching. The IMOC is basically responsible for calling all of these people and hello, come, please help share your expertise with us. Um, so that's basically um, the people who are involved in an incident. 
let's talk about what causes an incident. Any incident is caused by one of two factors, internal or external. Let's talk about examples to narrow it down a little bit. Internal factors, when, uh, for example, the delivery team starts a deployment to GitLab.com, they watch the services and they look, for example, at the error rate for some of the services. If the error rate is suddenly elevated after a deployment, then they right away know, oh, it might be our deployment. Let's say the infrastructure team, other than the delivery and the deployments, let's say someone from the reliability team is doing a change. Um, if they notice uh, an elevation in the errors or um, any other factor, after a change that we did to the infrastructure itself, for example, adding pods, removing pods, changing some sort of configuration somewhere, if they notice a change after sorry, if they notice a, an elevation in errors or a change in matrices after a change they made, then they know that they have caused that issue and they can revert it. So you've got, for example, deployments and an internal change by the infrastructure team. Um, an external factor, uh, for example, a surge in traffic, a sudden surge of traffic. Um, and in this case, it could be... Um, a normal surge in traffic, just an increase for some reason that's not malicious, or in other cases, it's an attack and our automated systems didn't catch it and didn't mitigate it automatically. So the engineer on call in this case is going to look at that external factor and they're gonna try to mitigate the problem. So. These are the two causes of incidents. Who can issue an incident? Anyone. Anyone can issue an incident in GitLab from any team once they notice something. Um, and and um, let's say, for example, a service that's not available. Of course, if you're if you're someone from GitLab and you um, you work for GitLab and you notice that. GitLab.com is not working, for example. I mean, that's the biggest service. <laughs> Let's say it's not working. Well, before you create an incident, you might want to check with the engineer on call just to make sure that the issue is not local to your computer. Maybe it's something local, so you don't really need to page or create an incident for that. Um, so you can always call the engineer on call by calling a specific Slack um, ha uh, name at something. I'm going to put that in the description because I don't remember at the moment. But yeah, you can always relay a message to the engineer on call directly before creating an incident. So let's talk about the incident room. The incident room is a very special room. It's a permanent room. Um, you can find the title of it in the incident management Slack channel and um, there's a permanent link to a Zoom room and that room is called the incident room. The incident room is a very interesting place because this is where all the fun happens. Yeah, this is um, a room that is accessible by everyone at GitLab so you can always attend any incident that is happening. Of course, if the incident is not severe enough, you're not going to find anyone in the incident room. Uh, but if the incident is severe enough, is affecting enough users and needs sync communication, you're going to find people in the room. Most of the people in the room are going to be the engineer on call, the incident manager on call, and sometimes the CMOC, the communication manager on call. And a lot of times you also find other team members from all the company, different departments, some people where uh, their specialization is needed. So if you're someone who's just curious, you can still attend the incidents and see what's happening and see, listen to the talk, listen to just like a shadow to, to the call. And that will give you a lot of information about how GitLab.com is uh, operating 
what is an incident? What is it like really in real life? Um, how hard the infrastructure team works to mitigate incidents. The amount of stress, you can see the amount of stress in the room. It's going to manifest in different ways. You, you might not detect it right away, but everyone is, of course, stressed from, from time to time and depending on the incident, depending on how, they, how the day is, when, is going. So some people are going to be laughing. Some people are going to be like really surprised. How could this happen? How did we set up our infrastructure to handle something like that or not handle something like that? So I find it very interesting. I find the incidents really, really, really informative. And I think particularly for support, because we also in the self-managed department of support, we participate on a customer emergency rotation. And it is very similar to the incident uh, room, except we are not responsible for the customer's infrastructure. So they basically handle that part in the customer emergency calls in the support team. So we sort of see the end results of what happens in the incident rooms. We sort of see, uh, we think of infrastructure as a black box. We don't really know what's happening there. And all we care about is the product, GitLab, and how it's running on that infrastructure. Sometimes the setup is too easy, like a one node setup, and it's just simple, and we know how to navigate that easily. Sometimes it's a more complicated setup, an, an HA setup, that where, where the, the setup is scattered among different uh, nodes, and that makes it a little bit more complex. But... If you're in the incident room, you're going to get to see the infrastructure side of the incidents. So you get to see the deployments, you get to see um, some information. Sometimes the engineer on call would share their screen and you're going to get to see the um, complex setup we have for GitLab.com, which is very interesting for support because we, we rarely see it on that scale. Uh, so I, I advise you to actually, if you're in support, um, perhaps um, subscribe to the incident management channel. And if you see an S1 or P1, um, severity one, S1 or P1, priority one um, issues, incidents, perhaps join the incident room and, and have a look at, at how the team is handling their incident. Um, compare that to how you handle the customer emergency. In the customer emergency, you're only responsible for making sure that GitLab is up and running. We are quite equipped to do that. Sometimes it's harder, but most of the times we know how to navigate making GitLab come up and be running. But um, in GitLab.com, they are the ones responsible for the infrastructure. So they have to do it. Even the black box for them is not black. It's very white, it's very transparent. <laughs> so that's the interesting part. Uh, the uncover a layer that support don't get to see in their own quotation. Um, so in the incident room, as I said, you get a lot of reactions. Some people are very surprised. Some people are, are um, stressed, so they laugh. Um, but more importantly, you find the spirit of everyone is like trying to help and everyone has got the same goal, which is get the service up. So that's the focus. And um, I'm going to actually compare um, what I saw in the incident room to something that I've learned recently as a parent. Um, I downloaded this application on my phone and um, it, it gives you a sort of a roadmap on understanding how to parent your child in a better way. And at some point they talk about bonding. And to my surprise, bonding with your little child is um, happens during the hard times, during the times when your child is, is struggling to understand their feeling or when they're crying, when they're experiencing a negative emotion. That's when real bonding happens between you and your child. And that was really interesting to me to see because... It did actually make sense looking back at all my relationships with everyone in my life. And I'm like, that's right. It's like during the hard times, that's when you really get together, get close. And you really, it's 
sort of bond and you have you establish this shared experience where you sort of trust each other more like I'm gonna be there for you you're gonna be there for me so I think it it is an example I think what happens in the incident room is, is sort of similar because it is a stressful time sometimes we have no idea what's happening and um because of that we sometimes we experience a lot of negative emotions but with the help of everyone you get you get to get through every incident we have to <laughs> right so i think what happens is that it creates bonds i think you see some sides of, of everyone you don't really see outside of the incident room uh, and i think it's mainly because of the stress so i i find it a very interesting place not just um on the technical level but also on the team level like how the team is, is interacting with each other um so yeah that's that's the incident room um during an incident uh, the the lifetime of an incident it goes through um a few phases so the first phase is when an incident is triggered um, after the incident is triggered, the engineer on call give it an immediate attention and they try to identify or observe as much data as possible to understand what is the impact of this incident on our users or on the different services. Once they establish what the impact is, they decide if they're going to involve other people uh, in, the, in the call or if they're going to try to mitigate it by themselves. And if it's severe enough, it's going to get the S1 label and it has to be uh, addressed immediately by a lot of people. They're going to get paged. Uh, once the, uh, the, um, these little things are identified, the impact, the engineer on call is going to try to identify the root cause of the incident. Um, believe it or not, I think that's the hardest part of the incident. I think that's the part that takes most of the time. So um, if you're lucky enough, you're going to do that under an hour. If it's an internal cause, it's going to be an easy identify and we're going to get to revert the change quickly because we're already aware of the change of the cause of the issue. But if it is an external factor, a lot of times it takes a lot of time just to identify the root cause or how we are going to mitigate that issue. So once we identified the root cause, a lot of times it's easy and quick to mitigate the issue. Sometimes it's not that easy and direct, but a lot of times it is easy and direct once you identify the root cause. Um, after identifying the root cause, you mitigate the issue, you apply something, a fix, a hot patch, whatever, just to mitigate the issue. Once the issue is mitigated, it's marked as mitigated and it's not as urgent anymore. But we are collecting all the corrective actions that we can take to prevent this issue from happening again in the future. So this work can happen um, most of the time. It happens async. Uh, there is a brief discussion about that in the incident room about corrective, possible corrective actions from here and there during the incident. Someone would say, oh, perhaps we can do that to permanently solve this issue in the future. And uh, these corrective ideas are collected and added to the issue at the end of the incident. And someone then takes care of that after the incident is over. So um, the main goal is to mitigate the incident. And once it's mitigated, we then look back and have a look and try to perform a root cause analysis for, for the incident, especially if it was severe enough to require a root cause analysis. Uh, sometimes the incidents are not severe enough, so we don't really have to spend that time on, on trying to find a root cause. Um, but sometimes if it's severe enough, we will have to perform the root cause. And the corrective actions are going to be implemented in the following weeks, months, or however long we can um, find the resources to do so. Um, so that's the life cycle of the incident. I hope you found this video uh, interesting and helpful. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Reach out to me. I'm Rehab Hassanin from the support team. And uh, feel free to leave comments below. I'm going to check it uh, every now and then. Thank you.